Hi, today I'll be talking about the APOP bacterial phytochromes inside the R. palustris bacteria. This paper is written by Carol, Dr. Carolyn Harwood and a, Ms. Catherine Fixon and a few others. And basically these phytochromes are responsible for making light harvesting complex four in, um, in situations of low light. And previous research has shown that they bind to this uh, molecule called biliviridin. So you can see biliviridin here in this form. It's uh, synthesized from heme. And usually there's an enzyme in the middle that uses oxygen to make biliviridin. And this molecule here kind of just absorbs red light at 700 nanometers and then it converts itself. Uh, which kind of sets the stage for the protein to do its stuff. This is the protein in question, the phytochrome protein. So basically this paper is about how does this protein func function when we take biliverdin out of the picture. And you can see in this graph here, these uh, the, the light harvesting complex four uh, absorbs light at 800 nanometers wavelength and 860 nanometers wavelength. So this graph is kind of showing how much of the LH4 is working inside the cell. And um, you can see in the wild type and in the HO mutant that this is how much it absorbs. But in these, in these other mutants where we take away phytochrome, they're, they're not really making any of the LH4, you can see that the absorption spectra is just the opposite of what it should be if we did have LH4. So it's kind of proving the obvious that if we don't have these phytochromes, we don't have LH4, which is kind of what we already knew. But it's interesting to note that if we don't have this HO, we still have the normal phenotype. And this HO is basically the oxygenase that makes biliveridin. So in a, in a way it's saying if we don't have biliveridin, we still have the same phenotype as wild type, which is which is the beginning point of this paper. So this is the uh, phytochrome and here they found some residues that they think that attach to biliveridin and they go about mutating these residues into alanine. Basically, it's a hydrophobic residue that won't bind to biliverdin. And they use this to study which ones do the trick of like of separating phytochrome completely from biliverdin. With this assay here, uh, they use zinc to indu induce fluorescence and basically test if uh, biliverdin is attached to phytochrome. And you can see basically that it's these residues that kind of do the trick, whether it's cysteine 28 or arginine 263. If you mutate any one of those into alanine, uh, you don't get any fluorescence, which means you don't have phytochrome and biliverdin bound together. In this graph, though, uh, it's a little deeper picture with uh, the, the cysteine mutants, you can still see that they absorb a little bit of red light at the 700 nanometer wavelength. So even though they're not really bound to biliverdin, they're still absorbing a little bit of red light. So it's kind of, they're not completely cut off from biliverdin is what this graph is showing. Meanwhile, with the other mutant, the, the arginine-263 or arginine-249, uh, you can see at the, this same nanometer wavelength, there's really no absorption peak. So this is a more thorough mutant where biliverdin is completely out of the picture. The absorption is not there. And so they chose this arginine-249 to be the mutant to study phytochrome when it, it doesn't have biliverdin in the picture. You can also see in the same plot that when we take away, when we 
switch arginine 249 into alanine, it just doesn't bind with the biloveridin at all. It doesn't do the fluorescence. So now that we have a mutant that does not bind to biloveridin at all, uh, we can see how we can see how much of LH4 it makes. And you can see in every one of these cases that the mutant makes just as much LH4 as a wild type in anaerobic conditions. And so it's important to note that this is anaerobic. There's no oxygen right now. And in each one of those cases, you do not need biloveridin to make the same amount of LH4, which is pretty cool. It's important to note that the wavelength of light does not matter. Whether you shine 700 nanometer or 750 nanometer, um, they both respond to it the same way. So it's kind of proving how it's not really the wavelength of light that matters, but the intensity of light that makes a difference. In this moderate intensity, you have lower absorbance than low intensity. So again, it's because there's no bill of Verdin, it doesn't matter if you shine red light or not. What whatever is responding to light is not bill of Verdin, basically. Uh, but this this slide is just kind of showing that oxygen changes the picture a little bit. When you have a little bit of oxygen, uh, the the mutant does not work as well as a wild type because oh sorry about that because it needs the um, because the oxygen will make biliveridin and then the biliveridin is needed to respond to red light. But if you don't have biliveridin attached to phytochrome, it's not responding to red light. So oxygen messes the picture up a little bit. So anyways, now that we know that in the in the lack of oxygen Phytochrome does not need biliverdin to function. Uh, what exactly is responding to light then? And then in the discussion, they reason that it is basically this quinone, uh, quinone pool, which is located next to the photosystem. And these reduced quinones are basically what they reason is affecting the phytochrome protein. And basically that is the major finding of this paper where it's you don't need biliveridin but you have these reduced quinones that also modulate bacterial phytochrome in the lack of oxygen and that is the major finding of this paper thank you